Welcome to this City Music Cleveland preview podcast for the concerts taking place on April 20th and 21st. And the program is a Holocaust remembrance of World War II Jewish composers, for the most part, who sadly did not survive. With me is my co-host, Jim Merling, and three of the six musicians who will be participating in the concert. Mari Sato, violin. Liz, although it says that she's a phone, is really a pianist, and Tracy Rowell, who will be our double bass player. Welcome, and I have lots of questions for you for what looks like an absolutely fascinating program, and I am so delighted that City Music is picking up on these composers who were blotted out of history for many decades, but who are now coming into their own and showing that the Nazis destroyed some absolutely fantastic talents and basically created a two to three decades long total blockage of any progress in German and European music. According to the program listing that I've seen, the first composer uh, on the program is a man called Gideon Klein, who was born in 1919, died in 1945 after being sent off to Auschwitz. A total tragedy because the more music of his that we become aware of, the greater the loss comes. So I don't know who chose the works on the program, but which of the three of you would like to open up on Gideon Klein's Partita for strings? I guess it's up to Mari and Tracy. Sure. Um, I think uh, Yael Cohen is is largely uh, responsible for the way that this program has come together. And uh, but we all um, agreed that this is a really wonderful composer. Um, he spent time in Tourettesen, and we've just been really enjoying um, the the music that we're going to be playing. To what uh, kind of things uh, do you do you see in the music? Uh, does it reflect the terrible times, or is it like Beethoven, where we always assume that the music reflects the mood of the composer? But in Beethoven's case, when he was down in the dumps, he wrote happy stuff. And when things were going well, he wrote some of his most tragic. Mari, any thoughts on this? Well, I would say that the second movement might be the only thing that would, you know, maybe communicate some of the great sadness that he may have been going through. But otherwise, you one wouldn't know. It's a theme in variations on uh, Moravian tunes. And uh, it's very, very moving. I mean, I, lo I really did not know this composer until last year and uh, what a life um, abbreviated by such a tragedy and horrific um, part of our history. So I'm glad that we are honoring him by programming this piece. It was originally a string trio for violin and uh, viola and cello and this arrangement for string orchestra I think it's even better, you know, to add the bass and to to share the parts around that it's a it's an incredible sound to have everybody together. One of the things that I'm proposing to do is at the the end of the section of the interview, I'm going to play uh, either the last movement or a section of it. And it, I think, exemplifies the fact that this is very chirpy music, mm -hmm. at least on the first or two or three preliminary hearings. I sometimes find that you know if you've listened to it half a dozen times you hear things in it that aren't quite as cheerful but it is very very easy listening and a lot of fun because of the playfulness and conversations among the instruments
Second is a name that uh, should be familiar to pretty much everybody watching this, and that is Erich Wolfgang Korngold, who is probably best known for his film scores, uh, especially things like Captain Blood, Robin Hood. He escaped from Austria uh, in 1938 and came to Hollywood, having been there once before, a few years before, to do the first score for Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream for the great producer Max Reinhardt. Um, in his later years, Korngold uh, was disillusioned with Hollywood and concentrated on writing what we would call serious music, and probably his best-known work is the Violin Concerto, which initially was scorned because nobody who writes for films can be a serious composer. And the fact that Yasha Heifetz pretty much gave the premiere of it. And from what I looked at this morning, there must be about 20 recordings of this. So God bless you, Erich Wolfgang Kongold, who was the most amazing child prodigy, who at the age of 12 had a ballet that was produced by the Vienna State Ballet, and at 13 wrote a piano sonata that the great Artur Schnabel took as part of his repertory and touring around Europe. Now, with the exception of the 13-year-old Mozart, I really don't know, you know, any anybody who's ever had that much support from probably one of the greatest pianists of the age. The garden scene uh, is from uh, one of his movies, an adaptation of a scene. The clip that I've seen is violin and piano. Liz, is, is that how you guys are going to do it, or is there string? No, we are doing a very special arrangement uh, for bass, solo, contrabass, and piano that uh, Tracy sounds absolutely gorgeous on. I can't wait to do this, to show this to everybody. And it fits beautifully into the program. And um, that is very, oh, very, very exciting. Mm -hmm. And uh, Tracy, all the best with that, because I've just heard it in a violin version and it's really quite virtuosic. But it's also lovely. There's a real schmaltzy really? romantic tone to it. Anything special about this of all of the uh, the Kongold works? What What appealed to you, or I guess to Yale, well, um, I came across a really wonderful recording of it um, uh, by Joel Corrington, who's quite a well-known bass player, and um, I just thought it was beautiful. And, and I don't know, I think each piece in, on this program kind of has a, a different kind of voice, and this one is just really, really lyrical and beautiful.
Korngold is definitely within the range of a World War II era Jewish composer, but he was not one who met a sad ending. Um, the next composer, Erwin Schulhoff, who does the two jazz studies, was a very noted um, Czech composer who was very strongly influenced by jazz, has the title, obviously, of this work, which is two of the five jazz etudes. But even in more than just his solo piano work, the jazz influence is there in his um, symphonic writing and orchestral writing. And he greatly influenced a number of other serious composers who suddenly said, hmm, this is something we might be able to do something with. Well, let me tell you what I found out about him. He is absolutely fascinating. He, um, there is no doubt that he would have been among the best known composers mm -hmm. had he survived. He uh, was promoted at an early age by Dvorak, who thought yes. he was just fat. And um, very innovative in his writing style. He makes the the 60s look pale compared to some of the things he came up with. In fact, he was the first one before John Cage to write a piece with nothing but rests in it. He was into Dadaism. He was into all this crazy weird stuff. He loved jazz. He absolutely loved it. He loved dancing. He could he dance all both day. playing jazz, well, piano, and spending the nights dancing. He would could play ragtime until until sunrise. And I just get this feeling, you know, that he had such a lively mind that he must have been really a lot of fun to hang out with. And recently the, um, the the Cleveland Chamber Music Society played um, a work he wrote for string quartet called Five Pieces, which mm -hmm. are really satirical takes on five dance forms. And they are absolutely delightful. And if you look up the, yeah. uh, the Wikipedia article on Schulhoff, the distinguished American critic Olin Downs gave a review of a performance of this piece in Europe and lauded it and basically saying, you know, there is nothing wrong with sometimes not taking yourself too seriously. Oh, wonderful. It's really one but of the, the best. pieces I chose because I was asked to do this solo, I didn't want to make it too long. So I, I thought I'll choose two out of the five, instead of five. I picked my favorites, which are the Charleston, made me think of him and his love of dancing, and the Chanson, which I believe it, it looks ahead to uh, Miles Davis and Bill Evans. And it's my that goodness. lyrical, absolutely gorgeous style. And you don't know what key you're in, but you don't care. He was great friends with Alban Air, and um, he had a way of using um, a tonality in a it just really digestible, understandable way. It's this this ch chanson is absolutely gorgeous. Well, thanks for sharing that, Liz. That that was really great. You and I have a great love for this guy.
Now we move on to um, a Polish composer, also a Russian composer, Mstislav Weinberg, who was a very uh, close friend and, in a sense, disciple of Dmitry Shostakovich. The two were very close, and both of them suffered ups and downs in terms of their cre creativity during the Soviet era when certain people set themselves up as arbiters of taste. And once you were damned, you know, you were out. And then it possibly a few months or a couple of years later, you would be rehabilitated and back on top of it. But the amazing thing is that Weinberg survived, although a number of his family were killed until until 1996 when he died in moscow at the age of 76 and he is sometimes double or triple the age of so many of these composers who didn't make it through the period tremendous number of recordings have been issued of weinberg's music uh, and several leading performers have taken up the cause for but my guess is that you'll probably find three dozen or more of Weinberg's works now being circulated and more and more groups like this being willing to um, schedule his, his works. So it sounds as though this one is a very substantial piece of music being a piano quintet. And I'm assuming that... Um, since a piano quintet typically would be a regular string quartet plus piano, that Tracy's not going to be in it. So you at least get your compensation with the solo, which I think is, is, is fabulous. Mari, what can you tell me about this as the, the violinist of the group and in terms of a quartet, in a sense, the leader? Well, this piece does, you know, share some commonality with uh, Shostakovich's piano quintet, which was ah, okay. also in five movements. Um, you know, when you hear the Weinberg for the first time, you hear echoes of Shostakovich's style there. And some of the writing, the textures, um, the ranges, um, some of the motoric um, writing, um, You'll, you'll hear it in some of the folk tunes that he uses. There is something that's quite different, though. I would say the last movement is very unusual and has a tiny little nod to maybe the Schulhoff, a little um, moment of boogie-woogie in Liz's part. And there's a very strange little Irish jig in, in that movement, too, which seems kind of random. And I started scouring the internet to find out, like, what, what does this mean? And as you know, there are so many recordings out there and there's a lot of scholarship behind this piece now. Um, and apparently his, his daughter said that um, uh, Weinberg had a great admiration for the British army um, and saw them as liberators. And so that's where that Irish jig came from. And oh. I thought it was interesting. And I wondered maybe if that little American boogie woogie thing also had something to do with his view of liberators during that time because this piece was written in 1944. So, I mean, I don't know for sure, but I thought that was a really interesting tidbit and it's really obvious. Um, I think the audience will hear that right away. Well, thank you for sharing that. Those are certainly bits and pieces we would never normally hear. And I think by hearing your take on this particular movement when we hear it in concert will be prepared for some interesting surprises there's mm -hmm. nothing like being for a work that you don't know being told some of the things that you're going to hear and when they show up the listener says oh yeah i i i knew that was coming and all of a sudden you start to feel at home in in the piece mm -hmm. the overall style is very dark i would say it's it's like dark Shostakovich, if you could imagine that. Yeah, easy. And yeah, it, it reflects his, um, he had not too long before that, maybe three or four years, escaped from Poland. But unfortunately, his parents and his sister didn't um, were interned and they, they did not make it. And I think this piece is just crying out in grief. I think this piece really reflects what he was 
possibly going through at the time. Also, there's an interesting thing about his um, his uncle was a very popular um, Yiddish Jewish singer in in Russia, very popular. And Stalin just he disappeared him. He made him go away, and it, that was just you know. So that and also uh, Weinberg himself was arrested soon after that. Um, and Sh his friend Shostakovich got, got him out of jail and kept him safe. It was soon after Stalin died that he got out of jail. So, you know, between the, his friendship with Shostakovich and Stalin dying, he, he made it through. So, um, gosh, the things he would have had to deal with, I can't even imagine. So here we have then probably the weightiest piece on on the uh, concert and yeah. five of you are involved in that which sounds really fabulous Our last piece is kind of a surprise um, given World War II era, era Jewish composers as the theme. The events were definitely World War II Jewish. And what you're going to be playing, I guess, as a finale to the concert is John Williams. 
theme from Schindler's List. Now, many years ago, I gave a talk on the subject of, is there a Jewish classical music and do you have to be Jewish to write it? And my answer, based on the previous work by my late friend, uh, Klaus George Roy, was, yes, there is a Jewish classical music and B, you don't have to be Jewish to write it. And in my talk, I always illustrated with this particular theme from Schindler's List when I ask the audience, is this Jewish music? And they say, of course, you know. And I said, well, the composer certainly is not. And a lot of the music he wrote, and I play them the theme from the Raiders of the Lost Ark and Star Wars, is not Jewish music. Well, one bit of trivia about uh, Schindler's List, I am playing on the soundtrack in the movie, <laughs> as is oh. my husband, Henry Perbrun. In, so, in the I didn't know movie that. you're playing in it? Yep, I'm, I'm, I'm playing in the, in the soundtrack of the original film score. Oh my goodness. Well, next time I'm going to shake your hand and then I'm not going to wash mine for a week. <laughs> <laughs> that was an amazing film. And um, there's a very, the violin soloist, I believe, was on the soundtrack was Itzhak Perlman. And okay. he's obviously played this in concert many a time. So mm -hmm. how are you doing it since this was an orchestral soundtrack for the film? As lead violinist, again, Mari, it falls on you to uh, help us out of this. Well, this, there is an arrangement out there by the Brooklyn duo that they, for their duo plus the Dover Quartet. And it is available to all. And um, I think it works very nicely. Beautiful. Yeah. Duo and string quartet. Right. And one of the cellos is uh, we are making a bass. Fine. Looks great. But is, is it going to be a solo violin or is it going to? It's the loop around. It's a real, um, yeah. We wanted to have all of us playing and to play a piece that was recognizable to the entire audience. Right. Otherwise, this is this is new music to most people. Oh, sure. So it's going to be complete. All six of you are going to be playing right. this piece. Oh, sounds absolutely wonderful. Well, thank you, ladies and Jim, for coming along and doing this. And um, I wish you the best for this concert, which I think is so important. And it's going to be repeated a second time. Jim, can you give us some details? This Thursday, April 20th, 7 o'clock at the Temple Tempereth, Israel. And then the next night, if you can't make that, come out to the Proxis Fiber Workshop. That's Friday, April 21st. That concert also at 7 o'clock. A very right. intimate space that is very convivial for chamber music. Thanks again and knock them dead. <laughs>